Hello, good morning, everyone. Uh, we're going to start after these, uh, these videos. Uh, one of the videos, the second one was about our new facilities. Um, third one was about our uh, new service of vertical storage of rotors. And the first one was uh, like a virtual visit to our facilities with our sales engineer, Olga Ivanushina. Uh, let's start out with this webinar today, uh, which is called, which is about Babit, Babit Bearings. We'll talk about uh, manufacturing techniques, uh, quality control, and we'll see some examples. Just let me introduce you, uh, PAG Jaume Nin, who's our head of technical research, development, and technological and innovation department. Um, Jaume has been working with us for a long time, so. Uh, <laughs> He, he's so expert in, in valid buildings and thermal spray also, laser cutting and so on. So uh, just uh, remember you that if you want to do some questions during the, the webinar, please use the chat, uh, the chat which is uh, available in the, in the part, down part of your, of your screens. And uh, I, will, I want also to remind you that uh, this is the last webinar of this year but we will start again on January with webinars. Uh, we want to do a, a webinar, webinars dedicated to a specific equipment, for example, for compressors or for uh, pumps. And we will uh, see which parts can we repair in each, in each type of equipment. So uh, if you follow us in LinkedIn or in our webpage, uh, you can be advised of all these webinars. So uh, nothing else. I leave you with Jauma and see you soon. Good morning, everyone. Can you hear me well? I hope so. Um, okay, thank you, Georgina, for this nice presentation. And welcome all uh, to this um, new webinar. Today, we will talk about baby bearings. Today, it's a rainy day here in Blanes, but uh, I hope that in your locations is, is much, um, much um, sunnier than here today. Yeah? Um, as Georgina has told you, um, the only way to communicate with us is by, by the chat option. Um, unfortunately, during my um, presentation, um, as I have to be quite concentrated on what I'm saying, uh, I may not see what you are trying to tell me because there is only just a, a small red dot uh, flashing in my screen and sometimes I'm not quite aware of it. So if, if I don't reply to your question during my presentation, at the end, there will be some minutes uh, left to, to open a discussion or to read your questions and, ask the, and, and ask, uh, answer them. So, so don't get mad if, if I don't, I don't um, uh, reply to you during, during my explanation, right? So, um, well, it's uh, two minutes. Uh, past nine, so it's I think it's time to time to start. Let me show you, share my screen with my presentation. Okay, okay, here we go. Yeah. So let's. Okay, let's start. So today, today's webinar is about uh, manufacturing techniques, quality control, and some examples of baby bearing repair or manufacturing. As you may know, in, in TM Commerce, we are quite expert uh, since uh, many years ago uh, in baby bearings repair and uh, manufacturing. So uh, in, this, in this webinar, uh, I would like to make a summary of the existing techniques uh, of the metallurgy, uh, a, brief, a brief introduction to metallurgy of these bearings, what are the most in, important um, parameters to, to control during the manufacturing or repair, and at the end, a bit of quality control. It's very, quite important. Um, the way we control the, the bearings, the way we can uh, agree in a, in a quality control level, and at the end, some, some examples, uh, and that's it, okay? So, uh, this is the index of today's presentation. First, metallurgical aspects, then manufacturing techniques, quality control, and lately, and finally, examples. 
So, about meteorological specs. Um, Babbitt, people call Babbitt Beerings because uh, Isaac Babbitt in the beginning of the 20th century discovered it, uh, a, a kind of lead alloy that was good for, for, for uh, lubrication, was, was, has, has a very nice uh, fiction coefficient, so it can be, can be um, used as a, as a, as a bearing. And from, from the beginning of, of 20th century to today, the, the technology has, has um, improved a lot, of course, but uh, those materials are still called valid beerings, valid beerings or anti-fiction beerings, but I would, I would all during one presentation, I will call Babbitt Beating, right? So there are two big families, uh, tin-based alloy and lead-based alloy. Today, lead-based alloy are not very used uh, because, of, because they contain lead, they contain cadmium, or even, even, even if they not contain can, cadmium because it's, it's forbidden in Europe, uh, if they contain lead, it's not quite healthy for the workers. So we, we try to, to not use lead bearings alloy. Uh, all bearings can be made of, uh, or can have a, a lead-based alloy layer, but new beings, we, all, we try to, to use always tin-based alloy. So I will concentrate on tin-based tin alloy. So um, bevit, tin-based bevit are uh, uh, alloys uh, that, that, compound, that has Tin as a major element, and then uh, antimony, antimony, and copper as the third and fourth, uh, the second of, um, and third uh, most um, common uh, elements on the alloy. But then there are some trace elements like zinc, uh, silver, cadmium. Nowadays, it's not it's not very used or arsenicum. But basically, tin, antimonium, copper. So there are different standards. Um, depending on where you work, where you work, where you live, uh, depending on the origin of, the, of your bearings, the, the lead, the tin, the babit alloy is, um, has a, the, 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 nomen the nomenclature uh, according to a standard, HTM, uh, the French standard, DIN, ISO, whatever. So there's a lot of uh, different compositions. There's a lot of, um, um, different families of, of tin based alloy, but um, we, are with our suppliers, we can, we can use, we can purchase uh, all of them. So there's no problem if your bearing is according to HTM or uh, French standard or, or DIN or whatever. We can, we can find the material and of the layer and, and then uh, uh, put it in, 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 the, in the new bearing or in the repair bearing with no problem. So uh, all these standards, uh, they, co they concentrate on chemical composition, right? Because the chemical composition will give you the properties, but depending on the way that you uh, pro process that uh, alloy, the properties will be different. So it's not, it's useless to, to start talking about uh, mechanical properties of Babbitt uh, in the standards because it, it depends a lot on, on how they are, pro, uh, they are how they are proceed, uh, the, how they are they are built, uh, dealt. So it's it's um, the customer who who comes with a lot of uh, mechanical properties uh, inqui inquiries. Uh, be careful with that because um, you, uh, the customer may may want that uh, the compressive strength is whatever. And I am not trying. I am not able to achieve this compressive strength because I test this in a, in, a, in the ingot, and the ingot is not uh, cast. So it's 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 not it's not nice to talk about mechanical properties of Babbitt bearings. We should talk about chemical composition, and with that, it's enough to to have a, a good a good material. So um, yeah. If, if we if one take a close look to the metallurgical metallurgy of these uh, alloys, uh, we will realize that it's more or less like that. It's a, it's a, it's a, in the optical microscope, there is a, a black matrix. The black matrix is a, is a tin rich solid solution, okay, with, with copper and antimony on it. And then we have this 
cuboids or this uh, square or rectangular shape uh, precipitates, which are cuboids of antimonium tin. And then we have this other phase, which is like needles, we call needles of an um, 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 intermetallic, which is called copper six tin five. Okay, so in uh, my in electronic microscope, an electron beam microscope, uh, the precipitates of or the intermetallic of uh, antimonium tin looks like a square, and the copper six uh, tin five looks like a needle. And now I will explain you how we control how we deal with these shapes, with the size of the precipitates. So if, 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 if one take a, an ingot from, the, from our suppliers and, and make a cut and, and prepare the, the, the sample in a metallographic uh, laboratory and they have a look on the microscope, uh, one can see that um, that, is, that's, that is one millimeter. So this is a, a very big region, a very big a portion of the ingot, the ingot is quite big. Um, so we can realize that, that in here, for example, in the, in the upper uh, micro, micrograph, we can see a small cuboid in the right side, while in the left side there's no cuboids and the needles need, uh, seem to be quite small. While in the, in the bottom micrography, uh, the cuboids or the needles, it's, uh, this magnification is not clearly, but I suppose that it will be needles. The needles are much bigger and are quite nice. Um, um, there's, a, there's no segregation. The, it's quite, it's quite uh, homogeneous, the, 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 the concentration of, of the needles through this uh, ingot. So um, just looking at the ingots, we will realize, we are realizing that, that um, um, there can be some segregation, eh? okay? So, um, yeah, if we have a closer look, uh, higher magnification, we can see that the needles can be, have, can have different shapes, shorter, longer, star type, yeah, and the same with the cuboids of uh, antimonium tin. It can be a rectangular shape, uh, perfectly square, um, we can have no cuboid at all, we can have a lot of cuboids, so um, the, the structures will be quite different, but every, every, always they will, con they will have the three components, right? The matrix, the cuboids, and the needles. So, um, yeah, um, in, this, in this picture here, in the right side, on the top, we can see, even if it's a very low mining magnification, we can see that these areas, this is the steel base, and this is the babit bearing. So this black area here is the, the babit bearing uh, alloy. And here we can see that the, in the bottom, touching to the, to the steel, the, the, the amount of, of needle, which is this tiny black, uh, white points, are the needles, so the concentration the density of this needle is higher here than here. So this means that we have some segregation. And also in this higher magnification micrograph, we can see here eh, a lot of the, the density of, of precipitates in this area is higher than here. Here the cuboids are quite big and here we don't have cuboids at, at, at all. So how can we control that? So we have the effect of the cooling rate. So once we, we, we take the ingot, once we melt the, the ingot, which is the raw material, and it's ready to be poured uh, to, into the centrifugal casting machine, for example, um, the cooling rate, or whatever the, the, the technique is used, the cooling rate of the babit bearing on the steel uh, will uh, affect um, the, the, the size of the needle. So high cooling rate will, will we give fine needles or slow cooling rate uh, will tend to, the needles will tend to grow. So large needles, no? Also, there may be a, a copper segregation effect. Um, in areas with high copper content, 
the, the needle density is higher because uh, you remember the needles is copper 16, five, so it's a copper rich uh, intermetallic. So the higher the, the percentage of copper in the matrix, the higher the density of the needles and uh, vice versa, right? And the presence of, of cuboids is directly related with the content of, of antimonium in the uh, alloy. So the alloys with more um, antimonium on it. And, and so the presence of cuboids will be more likely. So we have a structure properties uh, relationship. The optimal would be with no copper segregation. That means an even density of needles throughout the, the layer. And um, we also uh, know that a slow cooling speed will have large needles, okay? So now we have more or less understand that how we, uh, how we, um, pro pro how we process the, the Babic bearing uh, alloy, it will give us a different uh, microscopy, uh, microstructure, sorry. And how this micro different microstructure uh, affect the performance of the bearing. So um, we know that the, the amount of copper increases the mechanical properties of the alloy up to 6%. Um, copper contents above 6% are not allowed because the material tends to be so brittle. So uh, we are playing um, between 3 and 6% of copper. The higher the copper, the higher the strength of the alloy. Um, but always have this in mind. Copper 6, T5 precipitates are hard and brittle. So the higher the, the amount of copper content, the hardest and brittle it will become the Babbitt uh, bearing, right? The, the presence or uh, the appearance of uh, antimonium T precipitates also increase the possibility of initiating fatigue cracks because they also tend to be hard and brittle and also very large. So when, when we have, in normally in metallurgy, when, when we have a big precipitate in the structure, in the, in the microstructure, it's a, it's a weak point, it's a point where fatigue can occur. So uh, having very large cuboids is, is, not, is not good for the, for the properties of the bearing. Uh, so the size of the precipitate influence, influences the ductility, right? So the optimal structure will be with no copper segregation, a small, a small needles of copper 16.5 and a small, um, small um, antimonium uh, tin cuboids. This uh, optical, uh, op optimal um, microstructure will give us homogeneous mechanical properties through all the layer, through all the, the bearing, and a better fatigue resistance of the bearings. I'm talking about uh, fatigue resistance of bearings. This is for the ideal situation. Most cases of bearing failures are because of lack of lubrication, wrong startup procedure, and, and bad uh, installation or assembly. So ideally, a bearing will last forever because as long as there is oil in between, um, it will, it will be no contact, direct contact between the, the shaft and the bearing material. So it, 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 it theoretically, it, it lasts forever. The problem is that this oil uh, film sometimes is lost and then the life of the bearing is almost zero. It's because we're using that, eh? okay? So, so um, in those machines where the bearings are quite nice design and everything runs smoothly and there is no oil, oil leak and not, nothing happens, they will appear at the end a fatigue uh, in the bearing because the load is a cyclical load. Uh, in the rotors, there is no, there's, uh, sometimes there are some overloading um, and, and some cycling. So it's, it's uh, at the end, yeah, the fatigue appears and the finer and the smoother is the structure, the, the, um, the later will appear the fatigue, right? So uh, now a big, a big, and now let's change of, let's, let's, let's leave the metallurgy and let's, um, 
let's uh, explain you the adhesion mechanisms. How this bearing alloy, how this babit alloy, is is a stick to the to the base to the shell of the bearing, right? You will know that that there are um, steel steel base bearings, cast iron bearings, and copper alloys bearings. And depending on this um, on this base material, uh, the adhesion will be different. So, in there are two ways of mechanical uh, adhesion between the babit and the base metal, right? Mechanical one, which is the classical one, which is the the, the classical way um, uh, that uh, babit bearings were done in the beginning of of 20th century. Uh, is by the use of dovetails. The dovetails are this um, uh, shape in the base material that creates a mechanical anchorage. There's, there's a mechanical blockage that, that um, um, not enables that the bearing could slip on the, uh, on the base material. So it's, it's stuck. It's mechanically stuck. Here in this case, we can see clearly how the die penetrant test reveals the appearance, the, the existence of these tobe tails in this big bearing. And this is a classical way of, of fixing the babit bearing into the uh, base material. And, but there's uh, also recently, I would say from the last 30 to 40 years, so it's recently. Now we rely on a chemical uh, make, uh, adherence. We rely on a chemical adherence. We are not using dovetails anymore. Um, we rely on the formation of a very thin uh, iron tin or copper tin intermetallic bonding layer. Th this intermetallic bonding layer will act as a glue. It, it, it is created between the steel and the babit bearing. So this in between. Here we can see an uh, uh, um, uh, optical microscope with a high uh, magnification uh, where we can see the steel here in this area and then the intermet intermetallic layer is this, uh, this gray thin layer which is like a tiny hair that grows on the surface of the, of the base material. Here can be seen more clearly. This tiny um, area, this tiny precipitate layer that grows like a needle, like like hair, like like to, to the babit, and these black areas with with white uh, needles, this is the needles, this is the babit air, uh, bearing, bearing, or the babit al alloy. So uh, to to stick the babit bearing alloy to the base steel or base material, we need uh, this intermetallic layer. How this intermetallic layer is created? By a thinning process. We have to thin the surface. We have to prepare by thinning the surface, the base material. We have to prepare to be able to receive the babit bearing alloy then and to, and to glue it to the, to the substrate. So, that thinning step is mandatory and is very important. About the thinning step, about the thinning properties, depending on the on the um, on the base material, we will have uh, that um, thinning. It will be enough or not. Let me explain you. Um, we we use always. That is for new uh, buildings manufacture, or um, we, we, we use mild steel, the mild as possible. With mild steel, there is, uh, there is the certainty that we can create that intermediate layer, bonding layer, right? So we have to make some heat treatment to homogenize the structure to maximize the presence of ferrite because that. Uh, iron tin intermetallic alloy is created between the, the iron, pure iron of the steel and tin, pure tin of the thinning process. So we need that uh, maximum ferrite content. So we have to make some heat treatments to the standard uh, steel that we purchase to, to maximize this, this, uh, this uh, adhesion of, of the very, bearing alloy, right? So, um, 
in green, like like a traffic light, in green, in green, there's the mile steel for constructing the shell of the bearing, right? In yellow or in orange, we have, sorry, we have the bronze-based uh, bearings. Bronze can also create that intermetallic compound between uh, base, uh, base material and babit, which is the copper to tin intermetallic alloy. This intermetallic uh, compound is a bit more uh, brittle than, than uh, iron tin uh, one. So this um, intermediate bonding layer is not so is not as good as in the uh, steel bearings. So bronze bearings, even if they are not very common, they still can rely. We can rely on a on a um, chemical bonding to fix the uh, babit alloy on the bronze um, shell, right? And in last point, gray cast iron. Gray cast iron is in red, so it means that in gray cast iron, as there is no ferrite on the gas structure, and also there's no copper, so uh, it is, uh, as is, uh, there is no ferrite, we cannot create that uh, iron tin compound that will create the chemical bonding. So with gray cast iron, even if we try, even if we can use it, um, there's, there's a, a lot of possibilities that this uh, bonding is not created and then during the inspection, during the ending inspection, some lack of adhesion of during ultrasound testing or during uh, that, uh, dye penetrant testing will, will be possible and then some problems will, uh, will arise between the customer and, and us. So, gray cast irons are most of the of our new buildings are uh, steel ones, but obviously, if one customer has a gray cast iron and it has to be a, it needs a repair, we 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 deal with it. But mostly, we rely on dovetails to to pull to to assure to ensure the the, the bonding of the babit and to the gray cast iron shell. Okay. So, what are the manufacturing, manufacturing techniques available for Babbitt uh, bearing repair or manufacture? Uh, we have centrifugal casting, laser cladding, welding by tick or by oxyacetylene, thermal spray, and statical casting. I like to classify them according to the quality from my point of view, um, but yeah, it's not, it's not that thermal spray coatings are very far from centrifugal casting ones, uh, but um, if, if we have to take into account all the things like uh, bonding and so on, um, uh, I like to classify them in, in these four or five um, uh, points, right? So for me, centrifugal casting, laser cladding are the most um, uh, quality ones, then welding and thermal spray, and at the end is statical casting because it's quite difficult to control the solidification uh, front in statical casting. So it's the, there's a high risk of uh, defects in this in this statical casting. So let me explain. Let me give you a brief a brief overview of all of them. Typical casting, um, more relevant parameters. Well, a statical casting is is you know, eh? is, uh, we place the shell in a centrifugal casting machine, so it will rotate, it will spin, and we 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 melt the the babit bearing in a in a ladle uh, with electrical furnace, and then we pour we pour liquid uh, babbing alloy into that casting machine that is spinning, and by centrifugal forces, the 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 babbing, babbing, babbing material tends to um, stick on, on the shell, which is rotating, and then we, we cool it like uh, during, during a rotation. So the most relevant parameters uh, of, this, um, of this technique are uh, base material, base, uh, yeah, the base material, 
temperature before pouring um, because if the thin layer is not ready when we pour the adhesion will be null so uh, the shell has to be at a certain temperature where the tin is it's ready to receive the babbit, um, the melt babbit that will come afterwards. Also, the babbit met metal pouring temperature is different in, in each alloy. So, uh, and every alloy has a pouring temperature and that has to be uh, respected. The rotational speed is also important. And it is in, it depends on the diameter of all the radius of the bearing. And we have some, some calculation where we decide uh, if we have a 200 millimeter diameter bearing, it has to rotate at certain MPM to ensure some kind of centrifugal force, okay? To avoid, to avoid, uh, or to ensure that, that all the, the baby alloy when the, 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 the shell is spinning, Will, will stick to, to, the, to the shell. Cooling rate, also very important to avoid segregation. The cooling rate uh, needs to be one that allows that the solidification front of the melted uh, babbit alloy on the solid uh, base material goes from the surface to the inner surface, the inner diameter. So all the um, all the, um, the dirt, all the, the flags, all the, all the um, uh, slack, sorry, all the slack of the, of the pouring needs to be concentrated in the inner surface to be machined afterward and to be removed. Eh? And, and so we have to be sure that the, the solidification front goes from the shell to the inner surface. Okay, so the cooling rate and the cooling direction is very important, it's critical. Pouring position also to avoid turbulences and the plates, so the, all the toolings of the, all the fixture, the tools to fix the shell to the centrifugal machine has to be also uh, heated to avoid uh, um, a heat sink, to avoid uh, fast uh, cooling rates in different positions of the bearing. So, so all, all of this uh, um, all of these points have to be taken into account when when doing a centrifugal casting of the body bearing. Okay, some examples here we are uh, heating more or less and uh, more or less no we, are heat, we have to heat to a precise point the shell and then here we are pouring the, the babbit into the uh, rotating um, shell here we are just uh, um, uh, fixing the shell to the rotating machine. Uh, here we can see the pouring channel of the melted uh, bearing. And here the, how we can, after the, the cast, uh, in this case is a, is a, um, it's a pad bearing after, after uh, centrifugal casting. Laser cladding. Laser cladding is the latest technology arrived in this babbit bearing technology. It's a very, a very promising one. Uh, we have ongoing a research project with deals with it, um, and it's quite interesting, especially for uh, for flat bearings, for for axial bearings, for pad. Okay. Um, the most relevant parameters. Why, why laser is used here? Because we we create a real a real um, diffusion between babbit and steel. So we are not relying anymore in a tiny, in a thinning process, but in a welding process. In this case, uh, we can achieve very high um, uh, adhesion strength of the babbit uh, layer into the steel. So uh, it's quite interesting. Um, so the most relevant parameters will be laser parameters, later laser, and the power, the, the feed rate, the, the cladding speed, so on. Uh, a power control is mandatory. So um, the first layer is one thing, but the second layer, the laser will, um, will go on the first babbit layer. So the melting temperature of the, of the babbit is quite low in comparison with the steel uh, melting temperature. So the parameters has to be adapted to the second layer and not only adapted, but also control 
um, with a certain device, a certain closed loop control of the laser power that reduces the power as long as you are cladding. So it's not tricky. It's, not, it's quite tricky to, to produce those, those um, body layers by laser. And quite important, it does not require uh, previous tightening on the surface because it relies on a welding, a pure diffusion between babit uh, material and base material. Laser, uh, then welding. Welding is quite used in repairs. Um, a lot of OEMs, um, world-class OEMs, are using welding to repair the, the babits of the, of the customers. We're also using it because we are also using for these OEM, um, um, OEMs, uh, world-class OEMs. So um, by, by, by welding, uh, of course, it's, uh, <laughs> we, need, we need some skill because uh, at the end, is a welder who is doing the job. So if that welder is quite a ski, a skilled, um, we can, we, he can achieve or she can achieve um, nice, nice, um, nice uh, babit uh, layers. So what are the most relevant parameters? In this case, also the adjustment, the setting of the weld of the torch is important or always with a, a, like every welding. Uh, we have different welding parameters on edges than on a sliding surface because the heat input is quite important. And in welding technique, the, the most difficult thing is to control the heat input. Um, thinning is critical if we have to, to rebuild the whole uh, thickness of baby layer, we have to thin. So thinning is critical. And uh, yeah the quality or the porosity of the layer is quite dependent on heat built up. So um, yeah, heat control in welding is critical, <laughs> but okay, it's, uh, it's very used, it's very common to, to repair bobby bearings by, by soldering or by welding, and we do it every day also in, in, the, in the workshop. The quality can be uh, very, very good. Eh? Thermal spray. Thermal spray is, is widely used also. We, we, use, we use it quite a lot, especially for hydroelectrical application. Hydroelectrical bearings are quite normal to be, to, to be done by thermal spray. Um, there is the bonding mechanism here is not chemical, it's mechanical, not by dovetails, but by by a thermal spray bonding layer. Um, we rely on the mechanical anchoring of this thermal spray layer onto the base material. Um, the, the adhesion values are not so uh, high that in diffusion techniques like welding, laser cladding, or uh, casting, but uh, they are more than enough for certain, certain applications. The interesting thing of using thermal spray is to repair, for example, um, alternative compressor or reciprocating compressor um, bearings. Because those bearings, those bearings that go in the, in, in, the, in, the, in the road are quite thin, they're a thin wall. So if you want to repair them by a diffusion technique, you will deform them, them quite easily. So there's a high risk of deformation, and in this case, we can use thermal spray because in thermal spray, there's no risk of deformation because there's no heat input directly to the, to the babbit bearing shell. So, so it's quite interesting to use it for very, very thin wall bearing repair. The last of the techniques is statical casting. It's it was very used for very big uh, axial pads because this is a planar surface and it's easy to, to build like a kind of fixture, like a kind of pool where to pour the, 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 the melt uh, babbit and then to solidify it. But it's, it, it's quite risky because it's difficult to control that solidification front from the interface to the outer surface of the babbit for the slack to be there. Eh? So it's, as it is quite difficult to control the solidification front, is quite, the, the risk of having defects is quite high. So we are not using anymore. 
only in big, big um, um, actual building pads uh, for uh, hydroelectrical uh, applications. Uh, we, we use it, but otherwise we, we prefer to weld or to auto terminal spray. Okay, so now we have we have uh, talked about metallurgy, bonding mechanism, uh, manufacturing or repair methods. Now, uh, once the bubble layer is uh, deposited in the in the shell of the bearing and machined, we have to uh, test how is this bonding, how is the quality of this bearing. When we talk about quality of the bearing, we talk about bonding. Uh, we, we assume that the, that the um, composition of the babbit bearing will do its work and the properties, the character properties of the layer is, are, are going to be enough. The problem of the bearings is the bonding. So we have to test the bonding. How? By dipenetrant test or by ultrasound? Okay. So there are some standards uh, done for babbit bearings especially the ISO 4386.1 and .3. The type penetrant test standard is the .3. Um, and there's been some upgrades uh, of this uh, standard. And since uh, 2012, um, the, the, the inspection of the bearing by the type penetrant test is done according uh, according to, um, to ISO dot three. So in, in dot three, which is the penetrant test. So now we are going to talk about the penetrant test. What we are, what we are looking for, we are looking for, uh, defects in the sliding surface. The sliding surface of the bearings is the, the surface that will work with, uh, against the oil film, right? It's the sliding surface. So the sliding surface, um, uh, has to be inspected, uh, looking for uh, marks, rounded marks, linear marks, or alignment, alignment marks. And depending on the shape, uh, does this standard will give you uh, uh, some indications on, about the shape. And depending on the shape, it will be named as a round, linear, or linearly aligned mark. And then this standard gives you five class of uh, or five acceptance criteria uh, being the A, the more strict and the E, the less or the less permissive or the, le the less strict, right? So, uh, in, for example, in class, in class A quality for dipenetrant test, uh, there's, it can be no run mark, it can be non-linear mark, and it can be non-aligned mark, so zero defects in the sliding surface um, uh, this can only so yeah, they, they can only be some uh, rounded marks uh, smaller than three millimeters. Sorry, so the two uh, allow defects with a total surface or ins inspecting surface of six point three millimeters square. So at the end. Um, this standard give, give you uh, acceptance criteria. This acceptance criteria has to be negotiated or agreed between between the client, the customer, and the manufacturer of, or the repairer of the bearings, and because not all, all the all the bearings can have place I. It's easy. No, no. I want my bearing with place I. No, no. Be careful. Um, depending on the substrate or the base material, uh, some um quality uh, class um, standards cannot be achieved um, now if we if we jump to ultrasonic testing uh, the class here um, uh, tells you the inspection um, way of doing that. I mean, um, you can inspect a bearing with uh, different ways. Whole, the whole surface, just um, particular points, uh, and this, this ISO, uh, this standard uh, tells you uh, 
how to inspect. For example, the class three, which is the one that we are using in all of our bearings, tells you that we, you have to uh, test, you have to inspect the whole bearing, complete coverage of the flange areas and sliding surfaces line by line with a probe. In order to cover all points, testing is done with an overlap of the lines of 20% of the crystal climate. That means that the whole surface, the 100% of surface of the bearing and in the flange area and the joint areas has to be inspected with, with the probe, the ultrasound probe, right? Um, yeah, and then the, the quality of the bearing, it also rank as a group. There's group A, group B, B1, B2, group C, and group D. And it's more or less the, the, the class like in uh, dipenetrant test, which is we have class A is the top one and the class E is, is the less, you know, the most permissive in terms of appearance of defects. So here we have the group A, group of defects A is the less, the more restrictive. And in an old version of that ISO, it's quite, quite it, it was very interesting because it, this ISO told us that only the new manufacture of plane bearings with the steel backings having a wall thickness up to 70 millimeters um, without voids and bores and without intrusion of that line and area. So only for new bearings of a steel base, you could apply group A quality. Hold on, there's some, someone in the chat is asking. Ah, he's leaving. Okay. Thank you for your attendance then. Uh, sorry. Okay. So only for beatings that are new, not repair, new, and with the steel backings, not copper, not cast iron, can have group of quality A or B1 and B2. Be careful, eh? Also in B1 and B2, New, only new bearings of a steel backing. Repair starts on group C, but only repair of steel backing bearings. All those are made of copper and cast iron are directly go to group D of quality level. And of course, quality level A, B, C, D, and C, C and D, here the A is more restrictive, the D is more permissive. So in all the repairs, according to the ISO, um, uh, there has to be uh, class, class D. So don't, don't pretend that in a, in a repair, um, the bonding uh, would be perfect. Of course, that if, if it's a repair of, of a, st a steel bearing, you can also ask for a B1 or B2, but not for a cast iron shell, for example. So even that if we try and we are going to do our best to achieve the best bonding quality, if there are some defects by ultrasound or by pattern testing, it's normal. It's allowed by the standard. So don't get mad about that, okay? We have, and uh, what is more important is that you, we have to agree on the quality level before starting the job. So now, once that we have talked about metallurgy, uh, manufacturing technique or repair technique and, and uh, quality control of the, uh, of the Babbit building, now uh, let me show you a lot of examples if I am not going to explain every bearing because every bearing is different. You know all the bearings, how do, how do they uh, work and so on. So just a brief overview of what we are doing, of what we are able to do. So we can, yeah, we can do uh, paths, bearings, radial axial bearings, journal bearings, big bearings for, um, for um, iron ore or coke uh, milling in, in in a coal powder power station, uh, diesel diesel engines, uh, bearings, nuclear ones for nuclear uh, alternators or generators. Um, okay, uh, type rank type bearings, 
also flat for um, hypercompressor uh, in in uh, in poly in, yeah in um, in polymer um, um, plants for example where some hypercompressor exists so we we can have that bearing in those uh, guides also in, uh, in connections um, in, in crossheads for a, a crankshaft and for compressor for, for reciprocal compressor okay all kinds here for example we have a gray cast iron for a cement um, cement um, plant a very old one it's a gray cast iron and in this case with double tails and in this case we have to repair it so you can you can still see the welding beds that we have done to to um, replace the babit bearing that was heavily damaged so we replace the, the whole thickness of the babit bearing alloy by, by welding manual welding so we can still see here the manual the manual welds and now it's uh, yeah it's uh, it's ready to be machined we have machine split line the join in the spin is already machined um, and now we, we have to machine it the, the diameter right for example of the construction of some pads for a pad type bearing uh, in this case also manufacturing the mandrel blueprint in this case we were we were just in the beginning now we have to remachine and, and, and assure a complete blue blue blueprint uh, almost unit one in all the parts. So we, we are manufacturing a, a lot of um, yeah, different kind of journals, uh, bearings for our customers all over the world, uh, day by day. So we are quite experts. And don't forget, if you also have some uh, failure on your bearings, your bearings, we have some information. We can help you because um, to know what are the cause of the failure of your bearings, there are some. There is a relationship between the appearance of the worn or damaged bearing to the cause of the damage itself. So some root cause analysis, some um, investigation can be done according to the appearance of the surface. So if you have a, a failure on your bearing and you you don't know what what hap, what or what has happened, just send us some pictures. And we can we can try to know we can try to assess you on the on the on the cause of the of this failure. With that, I am ending this presentation. Now is the moment to for some questions, or always later to my to my email address or to or to our sales team people that they will um, contact you. So please um, feel free to to. Um, Okay, to ask some question. Has the process of the uh, question from Lorraine Barra has has to porosity of the lab on the quality? Yeah, uh, an excessive porosity on a babit could have a, um, an influence on the fatigue leaf. Uh, of course, uh, a lot of porosity um will cause even that it's round will cause some stress concentration around that port and eventually at that long time range it could it could reduce the fatigue life of of the bearing um for short for short uh, time there's no there's no problem um is there a way to control it uh, another question from Lorraine. Uh, yes of course um, in centrifugal casting, there is no porosity at all. Uh, in the only source of porosity is in manual welding. The manual welding, as I told you, uh, is quite dependent on heat input. So the way to control the porosity is by reducing the heat input on on the on the layer, and that means stopping for cooling, um, welding under water. So it's <laughs> It can be tricky sometimes, uh, but yes, uh, the way to control is by controlling the heat input. But that, that, that this porosity only appears in uh, in manual welding or in statical 
in a statical um, casting also, but those, then those poles are quite quite big. Uh, so, it's, yeah. Apparently, from now there are there is no more questions. Uh, let's wait for some minutes. Let's wait for some of you if you want some more. Uh, there's the Iraq from from Iraq. In Iraq, um, people, our customers in Iraq ask our salesman there if you, if I can talk about uh, thrust bearing parts uh, fabrication. Yeah, we we are fabricating not a lot, not not a lot, but some some parts during every year. Yeah, fabrication is uh, okay. Once the customer ha uh, sends us the the, the babbit bearing, or the 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 parts, um, we can perform reverse engineering to to yeah to to manufacture and then a new part or, or or the or the oil grooves or the lubrication uh, grooves. We have to we can perform reverse engineering, then make some drawings, then we can. Um, Manufacture. We purchase the steel. We heat treat it, um, and we um, then we decide what technique to use. Uh, if statical casting for big pads uh, or um, flat ones, or um, welding uh, for uh, small ones. If the pad bearing um, is um, uh, for thrust pad, it's uh, flat. So. Uh, but we use it by uh, manual welding right now. Uh, we are trying to develop a laser cladding for that, uh, a laser cladding process to, to, to manufacture new thrust pads. And that's it. Once you have um, applied the layer, then we have to machine according to the drawings and make some, some, some testing. Um, Vicent uh, is asking me, hi, what are the main criteria parameters for a great choice? Uh, that's a good point. Um, what we usually do here is reverse engineering. For new bearings, uh, it's clear that we have to have a drawing. The drawing can come from the customers, and most of the times in the drawing there is uh, there is some information about the Babbit grade. Uh, if not, we we ask for a sample. And we have uh, internal capabilities for inspecting materials with a spark spectrography, spectroscopy. So we can have uh, uh, an idea, an exact idea of what is the bearing alloy that it has to be um, recast or rewelded on the uh, new bearing, right? So even if it's a repair or even a, a manufacture of a new one, we, we can have some reverse engineering, we can analyze the, 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 um, the grade of the alloy. But uh, what is the main criteria to choice between different grades? Today, most of them are tin-based. Between tin and, and lead-based, the lead-based alloys, normally they tend to have more um, compressive strength so for those bearings, heavy load bearings with uh, slow rotation um, that, it, that can withstand a lot of compressive strength, people used to, to use uh, lead, lead, babbit, uh, lead babbit alloys. Nowadays, we are changing to uh, tin based with um, higher copper content, higher uh, antimonium content which are more resistant the the compressive strengths of those high copper uh, tin based alloys are higher so we tend to use these these uh, tin based alloys with high copper and especially there are some manufacturers some some suppliers of bevit bearings alloys that uh, has developed some special um, bearing alloy with silver content on it, a small content on it of silver, that silver gives you an, a very a, a nice increase of compressive strength. So, so uh, we are 
If I have to choose, obviously I would choose a team-based alloy for normal applications, uh, turbines, um, I would suggest uh, ACTM grade two, which is a uh, three percent of copper. For most demanding application, most critical application, we choose a six percent copper content with silver on it, which is our uh, great uh, Technofreak 109, and this is the our most refined, most uh, performance uh, team-based alloy. Uh, waiting for more questions. Um, well, don't forget that this webinar will be in our um, um, in our media, so in our uh, YouTube channel, uh, maybe also in our LinkedIn. I don't know, but it will be for sure in our website, ready to, to download it and ready to to share with your with your uh, colleagues in the. Um, because I think it's quite quite important eh, to know of it, this bearing technology. Uh, okay, thank you, Vincent, for your nice work, nice words. Um, so let me wait for one minute more, and then I will I will leave you <laughs> return to work. Um, okay. Yeah, okay. It seems that there's no more questions. Thank you again for your attention. Thank you for, for trusting us, for your repairs. Uh, we are a good partner. We are a, we are a partner who can speak with. Um, so don't, don't hesitate to contact us through our uh, channels, uh, YouTube channel. Um, our web uh, website is also quite interesting. There's a lot of information there. So um, let's, let's be in contact. And, uh, and take care in those difficult times, okay? Goodbye, have a nice day.